we're now being joined by, again, panel two. So Mvemba and I would like to welcome our colleagues, starting with Kristen Mackay from St. Lawrence University, who has joined us here at Brookings before in various events with the Africa Security Initiative. And she's an expert on democratic governance and political transition with a, largely a focus on this part of Africa. So delighted to have her expertise. Sasha Lesnev is at the Enough Project, where he has been instrumental in calling attention to the need for better monitoring uh, and better discipline in how the international community handles the mineral trade, especially from war zones such as in eastern Congo, uh, trying to avoid the kind of corruption and the kind of cycles of, of exploitation, corruption, and violence that have afflicted countries like DRC. And again, glad to welcome him back to Brookings. He was part of a panel in the fall where we had actually invited Felix Shishikede, and who could not make it as it turned out, but we tried to have a good conversation without him. And now President Shishikede wound up visiting us later at Brookings privately, but we weren't able to have another public event. And John Tomaszewski from IRI, International Republican Institute, uh, JT as he's best known, who runs their Africa program there, also joining us again for another conversation on this subject. JT's expertise is really continent-wide, but with particular background in Kenya, Nigeria, South Sudan, and Egypt, although he's passionate about DRC, and I've heard him speak eloquently again uh, on that topic, so I'm, I have no doubt we'll get a lot of insight from all these panelists. And I'm just going to launch right in and not frame another big question, but just ask them to pick up the conversation where it left off. They've all told me that they pretty much have thoughts uh, based on what they heard from Laura. Uh, and others in panel one. And so we'll just work down the row, uh, see where we stand, and then get you involved again for the, the final half hour or so. So Kristen, thank you for joining us. And over to you as to where you think we are in Congo, how we should view uh, this step, and also our options going forward. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you all for sticking with us for the second hour. And thank you for, for having me back, Mike. Um, yeah, I think the first panelist gave us a lot of, of food for thought, and so I think I want to build on some of what, what they had said. And I think the, the question that I've been focusing on um, is what room does Shishikete have for maneuver in the situation where he finds himself now? Um, and I'm of two minds. I think he has a lot of room for maneuver symbolically and in terms of really trying to shape uh, sort of the dialogue and, and the, the tone going, going forward. Um, because of uh, his opposition party being you know, the opposition party for, for so long, I think he has, and, and of course his, his father before, um, you know, really has that, that sort of symbolic power, um, which, which can be quite, quite forceful. Um, but I also think institutionally, he is very constrained. Um, as we've heard, uh, the National Assembly, um, he will not have uh, nearly a majority there. Um, and uh, as, as one of the other panelists mentioned, uh, President Kabila, the Constitution was, was altered earlier, I think last year, to say that former presidents will now have a permanent seat in the Senate, and it is likely that he will be Senate president uh, and therefore be able to still control um, things like uh, security and, and mining contracts. Um, and, uh, and so that will be a, certainly a, a, a big challenge um, in terms of you know, Shishkedi really being able to have his agenda move forward, uh, you know, uh, policy-wise and, and legally and whatnot. Um, and so I think the other question for Shikedi is, can he pull together the opposition? So clearly there was a split in the opposition uh, back in November when the opposition had at first uh, gotten behind one single candidate and then the next, very next day he sort of broke from that, that coalition. Um, and, uh, but I think if he is going to have that symbolic power, it's not just going to be rallying his base, but it's also uniting the, the broader opposition. And so the question is, can he and uh, Katumbi and, and uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba uh, and also Foyulu's camp, you know, can they come together? You know, can they be that sort of force against the FCC coalition? Um, because I think if they are able to do that, you might see some MPs in the FCC coalition start to defect. And this has certainly happened in, in other contexts. And so I think there are ways that chosen successors can, can outmaneuver their predecessor. We've seen this in, in Angola, um, right, with the new president sort of being able to outmaneuver some of the, the really entrenched Dos Santos regime that I think no one assumed that that would happen. Um, and so I think there, you know, he has some space, but as some of the panelists said earlier, he'll have to really be, uh, I think, dedicated to that and smart how he, how he uses that um, because Kabila certainly does hold a lot of the, uh, you know, sort of patronage power, the, the, the levers in, you know, the official National Assembly, the Senate. Um, and I think another question, too, is who will 
be able to um, control SENI going forward, right, for the next election? Uh, I think that's certainly a, a, a big question. Can Tshisekedi gather control or gather sort of influence in that body? Um, so that would be something to, to look forward to um, as, as well. Thank you. Sasha. Um, great. Uh, thanks a lot, Mike, for organizing this uh, panel once again on Congo. And I considered declining because the last person who declined the Congo panel became president. So, uh, <laughs> well, gee, maybe if I decline this one, I'll have some really good luck. Uh, I'm planning on running anywhere. But um, anyways, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, thanks a lot to, to those uh, on the first panel. I mean, I, I certainly agree that this is um, an important step. Uh, it's not one that anyone expected. We sort of had our different scenarios laid out, and this was not one of them. <laughs> um, and, uh, you, you know, I think that it, it, it's, it's, it's an important historic transition. However, I would, I would not use the word democratic because, you know, according to the leaked electoral results and the SENCO um, uh, uh, observation missions that, you know, the person who won got 19% of the vote compared with 58% or 59% um, that Fayulu got. Um, and, and then, of course, the, you know, what happened in Parliament as well. So I think first and foremost, there need to be uh, consequences for that. We can't ignore this and just, you know, uh, uh, move forward with this, um, uh, with this process and engaging the president. Of course, we need to engage him, but there need to be serious consequences. The United States, you know, has undermining democracy as one of the prongs in um, in the uh, sanctions regime and the executive order, um, we made a, the U.S. made a number of statements uh, saying that you know highlighting that aspect and that actors will be held accountable. Um, and, and so I think that that really needs to take place, uh, regardless of of whether we engage the the government or not, which we clearly are. Um, I think beyond that, um, it's really important for the U.S., uh, European Union, um, the African Union, uh, neighboring African states to really shift lenses to address this kleptocratic state um, that has uh, taken over Congo, uh, you know, for the last several decades, really, um, that has worked very well for certain elites and, and you know, increasingly so um, under the Kabila regime, um, and as, as well as uh, the foreign roles in that. It's not just Congolese elites who are profiting from um, from various corruption that's happening, it's, you know, uh, uh, various external financial facilitators and supporting the Congolese efforts to reform um, that system to, um, uh, to really combat corruption, to create much more accountability. Um, and, and frankly, the United States and Europe have, and we talked about this on the previous panel, a lot of actual leverage to use to, to push um, for those reforms um, and empower um, and leverage the reforms that the Congolese are pushing for. So I think that there should be two kind of main goals to U.S. policy in particular. One is to help create accountability for uh, financial and human rights crimes that really has never been the case. It just started with you know, sanctions against Dan Gertler and his network, um, but really uh, very little consequence for uh, the kind of mass theft that has happened um, in, in Congo for decades. And secondly, um, to use uh, the, the, the financial leverage that we have to push for um, some key transparency reforms that great um, Congolese civil society organizations have pushed for for many years. So I'll just give a couple of examples, you know, um, getting the state own companies, Jekamines, for example, to publish their annual financial audits. Um, uh, Global Witness and the Carter Center documented that $750 million went missing over a three-year period from Jekamines, and there's, no one's ever been held accountable for that. And Jekamines, although they started a nice campaign last year against international NGOs, never actually published um, uh, any of the data to disprove um, that. Secondly, requiring um, extractive contracts to be published in the subcontracts. We know from, you know, uh, 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 bloodhound journalists, let's put it that way, um, that uh, there's been a lot of corruption in subcontracts um, and, and contracts, and, and yet uh, the Congolese government has not followed through in its policy, um, supposedly, of, um, of publishing those. The China contract, $6 billion, has also not been published. Um, uh, thirdly, to establish a real criminal accountability mechanism. Congolese civil society groups, hundreds of them, called for what they called mixed chambers a couple of years ago, and the Congolese justice minister at the time said, yes, great idea, and then nothing happened. 
So, you know, that's an, an example of an initiative that really needs to be follow up to, to, to uh, address the crimes highlighted, for example, in the UN mapping report to address the kinds of crimes that the UN group of experts has pointed out um, and, and others. Um, uh, strengthening the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, establishing a new IMF program in Congo to help address issues at the central bank, and pushing for ba <coughs> excuse me banking reform. Um, uh, we we in our investigative initiative, the Century, have highlighted a number of corruption issues at banks. So, um, how can the U.S. and Europe and the African Union do that? Um, uh, obviously, it's not up to them to make those reforms, but we can leverage. Um, uh, the Congolese efforts to do that, um, either by the new president, um, Chisiketi, or um, Congolese civil society efforts by uh, uh, putting corrupt actors on sanctions lists and the companies and the networks that they control, by issuing anti-money laundering measures, such as those under the Patriot Act 311 and 314A, um, that can really stop the proceeds of corruption from coming through to our banks. Because the reality is people are transacting in U.S. dollars and euros, and they're sending their, their, their money to our banks um, uh, and, and to, their, to, to their correspondence. And lastly, to prosecute those where there is U.S. jurisdiction um, uh, for corruption. So there's a U.S. DOJ investigation right now into uh, Glencore and reportedly companies controlled by Dan Gertler. That should not stop. Uh, now that there's a new president, actually that needs to continue and those prosecutions should go forward um, so that there is some clear boundaries and that I think can empower Chisiketi to say, well, look, you know, the international community sanctioned so-and-so, I can't have him as my minister. That's, you know, I'll never be able to get investors, as someone highlighted. Um, uh, you know, so-and-so was Dan Gertler's business partner. There's no way we can put him forward as our, um, as our mining minister. We need to, to, to have someone else so that, you know, we have real credibility here. So I'll, I'll stop. Thank That's you. excellent. Thank you. JT, welcome and look forward Thank to your you. thoughts. Sure. Please. Um, so... So I work for the International Republican Institute. We're not a member of the Republican Party, so in case you're, in case you're, you're wondering, we have a lot of Democrats that work for us. Uh, <laughs> but we're part, of, we're part of the National Endowment for Democracy family, and there is, that family really represents in many ways what the, 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 the pride and the power of the U.S. system. And when you're talking about um, the National Democratic Institute, the International Republican Institute represents this two-party system. Um, Center for International Private Enterprise represents the value of private sector in a democracy and certainly the Solidarity Center in, in organized labor. Um, and in our work, collectively as institutions and certainly as IRI in Africa, um, we, we see a lot of elections. I'm, I'm leaving in just a few days for Nigeria's February 16th vote. We also watched very closely what happened in Zimbabwe. We were on the ground in DRC. We were actually accredited. They said no Americans were accredited. We were accredited. We didn't see too many polling sites because we didn't have a lot of ability to get out. But I think when you look at what we saw on the ground and um, seeing the issue of credibility, and that's what we're really trying to assess when we go into an election is, and, and by the way, it's not just election day. Um, it's looking at things months out, looking at the application of legal framework, the way in which the electoral process is being carried out as in accordance with the law, um, whether or not constitutional provisions are allowing people to participate in a process that is said to be democratic. Um, and then when you go through this process and then you see on the back end of it um, a voting day, and um, you know, we've been, we have been critical in the past of some of the multilaterals uh, like the AU or SADC who may so narrowly view some of these things, some of these elections, and say, ah, Election day was smooth. Things look okay. Let's move on. Um, we saw Sadek do a little bit of that in the, uh, in the Zimbabwe elections. Um, when you see the process go on and you get to the other side, which these days in, in Africa, uh, the transmission of results, the results tallying process, um, the announcement of results. We saw that in Kenya. We saw issues in Zimbabwe. Now we're seeing a DRC. I, I predict we'll see something in Nigeria similar to this. Um, you see a trend. So what that means is when we watch and we see elections take place um, in a country like DRC, and we're working with Democrats, small d, uh, on the continent and encouraging them and, and trying to help them either through strengthening institutions, working within civil society, or even helping candidates to try to compete in what is often a lopsided political landscape, um, it's very discouraging. 
to see an election come out that way, and then to see the international community yet again apply double standards. Um, I think the example of Venezuela is put out. But there was an opportunity there to perhaps prolong this a little bit longer and see if we could get some more data to look at um, was this a credible process, or at least if it wasn't a credible process, was what the CENI put out there the true expression of the will of the Congolese people? Um, that may have helped, um, even if it was a fabricated process, um, this, this president as he goes into now governing. Um, and I point you to what's going on in Zimbabwe today. I really have to. When you look at the way those elections occurred, um, yeah, election day was great. I was in Harare, peaceful. People voted. People were ecstatic. They were expressing their democratic right. But the months leading up to that vote and what happened after that vote were crucial and impacted the credibility of Emerson Mnangagwa as he took power. And now we're seeing in that country, once an economic crisis came, you know, came forward, um, now a, a break apart of a, of a number of political sort of institutions, including the ZANU-PF. We could see the same thing in Congo. Why? Because when you put a, a, an elected leader who does not have that credibility forward, it's very hard for them to do their job. It's very hard for them to enact reforms. Chisiketi has promised a great deal of things to the Congolese people. If you look at his, um, if you look at his platform, if you look at his public statements, um, we'll all be watching the La Lucha Fachi meter to see how he delivers on these promises. But he has a very very steep hill to climb. Now, what's the options for U.S. policy? Well, certainly, calling the election democratic, calling it an election, um, you know, probably doesn't help because certainly, as I go into uh, Nigeria, and if there are problems there, Nigerians will turn to me and say, but you people, you said this, this Congolese election was democratic. Um, are you going to apply the same standards to our election? Um, as, as people who are working on the front lines of promoting democracy and supporting that, trying to counter the rise of Russia, China, and other authoritarian models in Africa, it is a very difficult thing to do. Um, so the U.S. policy, yeah, you have to support Chisiketi now. You have to invest in building institutions. You have to create the Congolese presidency um, to not be the, the be-all and end-all to the running of the government in the country. That you have to have these thousands of newly elected legislators, these provincial leaders, these local elections that will eventually happen, we hope will happen, that have never happened, that we now hear from the CENI that has very little credibility, that they're going to hold. Can we make improvements? Can the U.S. push for those improvements? Can we help, if not foster very strong, credible leader at the top? Let's see what we can do at the bottom of the process. And there are a lot of opportunities there that are going to come up in the months ahead for the U.S. to do the right thing, to hold Chisiketi to his word, to his promises, to call out human rights abuses when they occur on both sides, and certainly support some of these thousands of newly elected leaders in the country. Fantastic. Uh, Femme, do you want to comment yeah, here? And then we're going to go to you. I've got one more question for later, but I'd rather get the audience back involved as well, so I'll hold off, but please. Thank you. Uh, I just want to add to the, uh, the entire spectrum that has been presented here. SSR, security sector reform, is key. Uh, the fellow from the uh, Belgian embassy. This is where the EU can be useful here. Congolese, like the Congolese government, the outgoing government, likes to talk about sovereignty. You know, they only talk about sovereignty when they're being pressured to do something that is important. Um, and the international community, EU has gone along with them. I think in the case of the US, we have the lay vetting legislation in this country. Felix is interested in working with the US. So there's room now been published. that we will help you restructure the military. These are certain things <coughs> that we need to do. And we need to be stern with this thing. In the past, ERSEC knew that things were not working in DRC, but we continue giving money. I mean, billions of dollars have gone into security sector reform in DRC. And over 20 years, there's still no army that is adequate and professional and all that. Uh, the US was engaged in training one battalion. Uh, as soon as Minova, the Minova crisis happened, the U.S. pulled out. I think we should not be that skittish. I mean, uh, armies commit violence. That's what they're for. Um, so we don't withdraw from helping them. We continue to work with them so they don't do the negative stuff, the abuses that we, we, we will not like, want them to do. So I think on the SSR level, 
we have another opportunity now to really force Felix and say, if you're going to be president, the Ministry of Defense is a regalian uh, function in DRC, so it belongs to the presidency. He might not control the uh, parliament, but he should be able to put order in DOD, uh, the Ministry of Defense anyway. And there's room there for both the EU and the U.S. to engage. Thank you. Okay, so let's go back to you. Uh, we'll do, again, three or four questions at a time. We'll start back uh, with my friend Scott, and then we'll uh, work forward. Good morning. Scott Morgan from Red Eagle Enterprises. I do a security and threat analysis. Uh, President Shishkadi has already announced plans to ask for the international community for assistance to deal with the militias in the East. How does that look in your viewpoint? And the second question is for Sasha. I've heard you mention all of the available sanctions that are available that could be used. I was wondering what you thought about using the Maniski sanctions against some of the perpetrators in the DRC as well. Thank you. Okay, and let's, let's take another hand in the far back row. Yes, please. Um, hi, my name is Christian. I'm from South Kivu. I go to GW Law. I'm wondering, uh, just to piggyback on the last question, or the last segment, you mentioned bring, bring U.S. intervention, military intervention, into the Congo. Obviously, there's a big security issue with regards to uh, uh, rebel groups from, from, different, from different regions, different countries, and from Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi, and South Sudan, all in, in the Congo right now. And I'm wondering uh, what kind of intervention are you looking to have the U.S. Uh, engage in in the country? Obviously, there's a lot of regional instability uh, that needs to be worried about. And so uh, a lot of implication goes on into, are you, are you looking you know, to carpet bomb uh, these leaders or these rebel groups? Are you looking to, uh, and what are the implications of, of Russia and, and China and their involvement in the region now that they're, they're seem to be more engaged? Yeah, I'll clarify what I meant in just a second. No, <laughs> uh, it wasn't, wasn't that. <laughs> so let, let, let's see who else in the back uh, might want to get involved and then we'll keep working our way forward. Anybody else? In the, we've got a hand up here in the front. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Bob King. Uh, I would like to know, uh, it's just a question. Would you tell us what do you think about the future of opposition in DRC? Because Kabila should be one of the devil, but he's shown us that most of people in Congo, the one that was calling like opposite opponents of Kabila regime, are just corrupt. Okay. And then do, do we have a final hand, or should we come back to the panel now? Okay, so we'll, we'll now respond. And uh, we'll go through this round. If anybody else gets questions, we'll have a second round. I've got one more uh, for the panel as well before we would wrap up. Uh, but we've got still a half hour to go. Let me just clarify. So what I was talking about with a security force assistance brigade, this is not a combat unit per se. It may, have, uh, it may begin as a combat unit, but then it is transformed. And the Army has actually been building a couple of these now, where the idea is to go out in the field in groups of 15, 20, 25 people and work at the tactical level with a unit that might need help with planning and training and structuring its own units. So what I'm suggesting is if the opportunity presents itself within the broader overall UN mission that continues to be necessary, and I agree with Mulala from the first panel and others that it still is necessary, but it has to get better. It has to also think about a time horizon by which it would work itself out of a job ultimately. It's, I'm not suggesting we put an artificial constraint. I like Tom Pariello's three-year goal, but I think Tom would probably agree with me that that should be a goal, not an absolute requirement. And it's probably going to take longer than that. But my suggestion is unless the Congolese military begins to get better in the field, uh, and there was also a suggestion earlier that perhaps uh, President Chishikete needs to replace some of his field commanders, and look for more, in some cases, more competent people who are more effective in the field. That whole process could benefit from a few, maybe up to a few dozen American teams that are in small numbers out there in the field to work, not just at national training centers, but in the tactical locations in the East and help people conduct their operations most uh, effectively through mentoring, through advice, uh, through training. They can protect themselves, but otherwise they are not combat units per se. That's the concept that I was suggesting we consider applying to the DRC and the UN mission there. But let me now work down the panel with whatever comments you'd want to make or answers in response to the various questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it sounds like most of the questions were about sort of regional security concerns, and, and I'll let other people who are, have more expertise in that uh, speak to that. 
But I think one more, if I might sort of indulge my indulge myself in you, uh, just another related point to what was brought up earlier uh, among the panelists. Um, I think what's been interesting for, for me is to look at the very quick change in the international uh, response, right? The, the initial response was one of being skeptical about the results, you know, SADC and the AAU and you know, the EU and US, um, you know, really questioning the results, saying let's delay uh, the announcement of who's going to be president, and then very quickly, once the Constitutional Court made their ruling, it was a very quick, you know, sort of 180 turnaround. We, I think, uh, JT was saying that the State Department press release said we welcome the new president, or right? the sort of very, very uh, big change in language. Um, and to me, I, I think we can think about that as, or explain that by thinking about, well, who were those initial combinations of the process uh, sort of geared towards? And I really think it was actually geared toward the Constitutional Court judges and giving them sort of the space and latitude if they wanted to find the results not credible, giving them sort of international backing to do that. Just like we saw in Kenya um, the, the previous year. And then I think when the court did not sort of take that, uh, that, that, that leeway that was maybe provided and, and you know, ruled in favor of the results not even um, you know, going to a recount, that's when you all of a sudden saw then the international community very quickly change. I think that was kind of an, an interesting dynamic to watch, watch play out between another institution in the Congo, right, and sort of respecting their legitimacy as an institution and not wanting to question that because the legitimacy of the courts is also a very big, big question, just like the legitimacy of the, the executive. Um, so I think that's interesting to, to sort of look at uh, as we think about the international community and, and the reactions that, that we're, we're putting out. That's great. Thank you. Sasha. Um, I think that we need to um, <clears throat> step back for a second and, and be, give a realistic assessment of where the new government stands, right? That, you know, look at the photos from the inauguration, you know, Kabila and Chisakedi really, you know, joking and laughing and hugging each other. I mean, the, this is not a real transfer of power yet. I mean, you know, the reality, and we've never seen uh, any protests from any of the 80-plus um, Kabila companies and people who control them, <laughs> anything like that, right? So all these people are feeling right now that, okay, like, you know, basically we made some sort of a deal and, you know, we're going to be here for some time to come and we're no, seeing no real signals um, from Chisiketi that he's, he's really going to uproot them and, and, and change this equation. And so, you know, we can talk about all the new things that we'd love um, uh, uh, President Chisiketi to do, but the reality is that he's, he's highly, highly constrained. Kabila controls the legislature, as we've talked about. Um, he, he has such strong um, uh, uh, network in the military, I would say, that he really controls that. Um, obviously, he, he uh, uh, amended the Constitutional Court uh, a few months ago and, and clearly um, has a very, very strong network in the judiciary. And, and you know, we're told from recent um, news that he's, he's basically holding a, a veto power over many of the various appointments in the executive, even. So <laughs> he's actually a very strong player in this equation. And so, you know, the U.S. can say, well, you know, we really want to push for X reform. For example, you know, we'd like to see some military reforms and some people reshuffled. And he's going to be like, uh, how do I do that? You know, these, these networks are really in there. So that's where I think we get back to the leverage and the sanctions and the money laundering measures and that financial piece of things um, that, you know, if the U.S. pushes for some of those reforms, and backs it up to say, well, actually, we're going to sanction so-and-so general, we're going to sanction so-and-so head of bank, etc. Then I think we can finally s to see some, some actual reforms because they're backed by something strong. These people don't, you know, um, uh, only just buy farms in Congo, although they have, although some Congolese people have burned them down, as we've seen mm -hmm. in Beni, for example. But uh, uh, they also launder their money in South Africa, Europe, here, um, et cetera, and through, um, through uh, various international companies. So to get to your question, Scott, this is a long-winded answer, um, we need both the, the executive order on Congo, which talks about undermining democratic institutions, but also, of course, the global Magnitsky, which is really the U.S. tool, not just in Congo, but elsewhere, to combat corruption. And so you know, the, we would certainly hope that the next round of GLOMAG designations would include some key um, individuals who, and, and their companies that have been involved in corruption to leverage those kind of reforms. Excellent. Ndamba. I'll, I'll address the question of the future of uh, the opposition. Uh, Jetty mentioned the platform, uh, Felix Chisekedi. Felix has made a lot of statements. Uh, the last one that really raised flag for us Congolese is when he said Kabila is his uh, strategic partner all of a sudden, and that uh, 
in the spirit of reconciliation. I mean, it was as if he won and forget everyone else. It's just my arrangement with Kabila. Hmm. Well, the struggle has been a struggle of everyone. You know, UDPS may be 38 year old, but there are many other groups that have been fighting the system before UDPS, the civil society groups, the advocacy groups. So whether there will be reconciliation or not, that's something that uh, the parliament should be involved in, the people should be involved in, uh, civil society and so on. So you cannot just make deals and make pronouncement and say now we're moving forward. And why is that important for the opposition? Well, the opposition has lost people. People have been killed in the streets. Youth movement have lost people. Um, advocacy group have lost people. UDPS has lost people. So when you make statements like this, what does that mean for the opposition? Does it mean you're going to work the same way it was with Kabila? Because now we all are friends, we are demo democratic partners? Or does it mean we will punish people who need to be punished so we can continue expanding that political space and opening it further so people can join that space to continue looking for better? He's come from the opposition, but we've known people who come from the opposition will become worse when they get to power. Uh, so we hope that will not be the case for him. We hope that the ranks of UDPS will be the first one to go after him in protesting uh, when that doesn't happen. Uh, as far as the other side of it, I think groups like IRI, groups like NDI, and other groups uh, in Europe that have been engaging um, the opposition should continue engaging them and continue insisting on the opening of that space, but also giving skill set. I think one challenge in the opposition, DRC, or el elsewhere really, is one thing to protest, is another thing to organize in terms of where you can be effective in parliament. Opposition is not just in the streets. Opposition should be, in the DRC there's this space actually where most of the laws in, the, in, in DRC comes either from civil society or from the opposition. The Kabila majority is not known for conceiving laws and pushing them through. Uh, it's the opposition and civil society that push that. So there's a lot of room to, uh, there's a lot of future for civil society, for opposition in DRC. I've been going back and forth with a lot of my Kenyan friends who are in the Jubilee government. They're very proud to have Uhur Kenyatta uh, attend the inauguration. Um, their, their view is, listen, the court spoke. You Westerners, you people, you must respect institutions. Um, and I think Vemba makes a good point. The institutions exist, but they require uh, a great deal of capacity building. If we're going to talk about what the U.S. can do, uh, it is to look at those institutions and seeing how ever imperfect this leader is, um, providing him with some room to do something that is not just driven out of uh, the presidential palace, but can be done by others within the government and other institutions. And that starts with the SENI. That starts with a highly corrupt, uh, very opaque and unanswerable uh, SENI chair who needs to be held accountable for violating several clauses of the electoral law, uh, the Constitution, and who has a lot of questions to answer about procurements and other things. Then, looking at things like the judiciary, I think political parties is another piece in this. Um, I'm not saying create more. I mean, what are we at, 700 now? I think that's the last number. <laughs> I mean, when you tell, we always think it's ridiculous that Nigeria has 91 committees in its National Assembly, but 700 political parties is a new big number in Africa that we look at and we say something, you know, there's a need for some reform there. But there are things on its books. I mean, Congo has good laws, by the way. They have a, they have a good electoral law. They have... Uh, they have people who um, are there to enforce those laws. So it's working with them to, to do that. Um, there's political party financing that can be uh, applied that's never applied. Um, you can have these local elections. And again, I go back to this issue. To build democratic culture, you have to give people access to something. But if you're electing MPs in a way that's not transparent, that you didn't actually vote for that person, that person doesn't really represent you, then you have a challenge accessing that person. So looking at Let's find some of those democratic champions on the ground. Let's, let's work with the youth. Let's work with civil society. Let's get them to engage. Because you're right, Vemba, the street is not the way um, in a system like this where you're transitioning and you're trying to move something forward. Um, without that, you're going to continue to have these, these major setbacks when it comes time for people to make hard choices. Um, I would just put one big plug in. I think um, we're always trying to wonder how do we invest 
in elections to make elections better on the continent. I would say the domestic observer groups did a heroic job, while imperfect in many ways, uh, from a technical level, a political level, and other levels, um, that they were there, they were present, uh, they delivered fairly good and reliable information, and an investment in that and working with civil society to strengthen that will also help to ensure that elections in Congo um, at least have a stronger watchful eye in the process. We're thinking right now about how we'll do this in Ethiopia. We've never had a, we haven't had democratic elections there in a long time. Even building that from the ground will be a massive undertaking that will require several elections to finally get a group that's skilled enough to do this. I think we have some groups that can be invested in so that as this process goes forward, um, the elect next election will be forced to be better. I think this comparative perspective is really helpful both for drawing lessons but also realizing how whatever happens in one country will reverberate and echo elsewhere. So I have a couple of questions before going back to the audience for one last round and starting with maybe JT and Kristen, but they're about this broader question of linkages across countries. And one, you know, when we think about the relationship between Shishikede and Kabila, I can't help think about Medvedev and Putin. And uh, it leads me to the question, of course, Medvedev served one term and then Putin came back. And Putin not only came back, uh, he came back and he changed the constitution to allow for longer terms. And it smacks of Kagami without the virtues of Kagami. Uh, uh, but but um, the question is, should there be a stronger international norm in favor of two terms lifetime, the lifetime limit, rather than two consecutive terms. I realize it's not our job to write everybody else's constitution, but should we try to use our influence, our assistance, our sanctions, uh, our economic blessings and investment opportunities and you know everything we have in sort of terms of soft power and economic power to try to push for a norm that two terms lifetime is enough? And then, and that's one big question which people may or may not want to comment on. The other, I'm, I'm also struck, one of the reasons why I'm 51% optimistic is, you know, again, I just still can't quite believe we got this good of an outcome as bad as it is. And, uh, you know, I lived in Zaire, 82 to 84, and all the rest of us have watched this country suffer uh, for decades, and I did not pr predict as good of a last year with a new leader who is the uh, scion of a great, a dissident and human rights and civil society campaigner in Congo's history being president. So it's a bigger opportunity than I expected, which makes me ask, um, even though I hear all the critiques of how the, a rigged election can't be a good thing and it reverberates in other countries, do we need to also think about how do you incentivize the Kabilas of the world to step down? And my guess is that Kabila was petrified of, of uh, the lead candidate, Fayulu, winning because he had said publicly, I believe, that he would have prosecuted uh, crimes that he uncovered. There was certainly an expectation that Kabila and his cronies would have been in the spotlight. Now, we might say that's appropriate, but Kabila's not going to feel that way if he has anything to say about it. And somehow he sort of did a, 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 an unsavory deal here, but he did a deal that got a better guy in power. And apparently, there might have been an agreement that there would not be prosecution and maybe even a Medvedev-Putin kind of thing down the road. We'll find out. So to discourage that, should there, my second big question, should there be a norm that basically when Kabilas of the world are facing the possibility of elections, that they get some degree of immunity? Um, maybe not complete immunity. You don't want to allow them to just go out and commit mass murder with absolutely no consequences, but some degree of limitations on what kind of retribution might, might be focused on them and their close circles after they step down from power. Because in the absence of that, it seems to me you need a miracle to get even as good of an outcome as we've gotten in DRC. And JT, I know you thought about this, and Kristen, so if I could start with you two, uh, and then anybody else who wants to weigh in as well. Uh, I can't wait to hear Sasha's answer on that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would just say this. I mean. Um, listen, this very small, wonderful country that was a major example and helped our work uh, extraordinarily across many African countries was the Gambia, right? You have this election, this guy Yaya Jame gets tossed out at the ballot box in a process where Gambians vote with marbles. It wasn't as complicated or electronic voter machines. It was a simple process and a good one. And the ones that the Gambians liked, they liked that process. Mm -hmm. But as this transition went on, initially, 
John May comes out and says, oh, I accept the results, everything's good. And then someone starts saying things like, yeah, we should put him in the ICC, we should deal with him. <laughs> Um, and then all of a sudden he's like, whoa, wait a minute, you know, and then uh, we know the rest of the story with Echo Was and everything and then he finally goes away. Um, but even till today, the Gambians are going through this process of trying to reconcile this issue of what to do with Jame, right? Don't push too hard, but also this reconciliation commission that they've gone through and the investigations, you know, it'll go on for a long time and no one will ever be fully happy. I think when you talk about the issue of immunity for leaders, it's really up to the people in that country um, to come together and be allowed the space to come up with a process that works for them. Um, I remember speaking with someone uh, in one of the Gambian ministries at the time of this reconciliation process uh, in the justice ministry, and he said to me, well, you know, the Americans and the Europeans, they want us to go through this commission in the Sierra Leone model. We'll just do it. This is what they want. But we think we could just handle this by ourselves. We don't need all these models. We'll do it our way. Um, so it's important that also that when we're putting those norms and standards out there, that we're trying to be as inclusive and encouraging as possible to bring those voices to bear. I think the other issue links to this issue of two term limits. Uh, people, I think there are a lot of Africans in the crowd and certainly who will watch this video and say, well... What about your members of Congress and your senators? Uh, these ones need term limits too in your country. Uh, I think that's also up to the people. And frankly, putting that in a constitution doesn't actually fix the problem a la Kabila, <laughs> a la a number of other people. Uh, you'll either not follow it or you'll find a way around it or you'll engineer an electoral victory that will give you what you want. So it is about broader reform efforts. Um, there can be an encouragement that there needs to be term limits. Certainly, as the U.S., we can talk about the benefits of that, um, whether or not you like the current and the former president and how that goes. But I think that, that certainly is something you talk about. I think in our work, uh, when we talk about democracy around the world, we actually don't go into a country and say, the Americans are great, look at our... No, actually, we say, we've screwed up a lot. Let's talk about all these things. There's some dangers here. Maybe you should think about this. How can we help you? Right? So there are, there's a conversation that I think has to take place. But we also have to be credible when we go to the table and have that conversation. Mm -hmm. right? If we call an election and say the word democracy or democratic in a statement about an election that's smacked of serious credibility issues, it creates a problem for us. Right? And then when we are talking about these issues, we, we have to work through that and it makes it even more difficult conversation. And then finally, I think the, the issue is there are positives in this election. You had a historic transfer of power. You had more polling units than in the last election. You had a voter roll that had more data. It did have somewhat of a biometric process. The evil electronic voting machines turned out to be not so evil. Uh, <laughs> but certainly, the full benefit of them have not been realized. And a lot of questions should be asked about their integrity. There are positives that come out of this election. And uh, we should focus on them as well. Great. Thank you. Kristen, over to you. And then Sasha in November. Sure. Yeah, I think JT brings up great points about, you know, having these blanket prescriptions about two term limits, you know, uh, uh, full stop and, and immunity. Um, it, you know, it's hard to make those, those blanket statements because I think context is specific. And like you said, with the, the sort of the will of the, the citizens of, of those countries. And I think, too, with, with the immunity question, because that is something I, I've thought about, I, I think certainly it can be a pragmatic tool to, like Mike said, encourage leaders to step down. But I think that the problem with that is that it's not just the leader, you know, the, the president that we're talking about that's really entrenched in power. It's his, his or her network, right? It's his or her, you know, the whole apparatus. And so giving just the leader immunity really doesn't get us that far because his network below him uh, or her are always going to be pushing that leader to stay in power. We, even if you would be granted immunity, you know, what would happen to all of us? What would happen to those sort of pictures networks? What would happen to the whole sort of ruling co coalition? And so I think the immunity... Uh, Pledges are, are sort of a little bit shallow in terms of, of, of that aspect. And by the way, just a quick aside as we go to Sasha, that's one of the reasons I thought the peace process or the, the uh, UN process in Syria had no chance. Assad, first of all, wanted to win the war, and maybe he now has. But secondly, he wasn't going to desert the rest of his cronies and take exile in Russia for himself and leave his Alawite people to be slaughtered at the hands of, a, as he saw it, of a uh, group that might come in after. Just one quick point. I would also argue... How has uh, Mugabe leaving Zimbabwe changed Zimbabwe's democratic fate? I mean, there are. <laughs> we, have we gotten something better or not? I think the Zimbabweans would have some serious opinions about that. Great. Sasha? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the incentive part is is uh, relevant, but you know, I, I think that actually there have been a lot of behind the scenes efforts on that on Congo, and a lot of diplomats spend a lot of time thinking about that. I know there were a lot of active talks of, you know, oh, putting him possibly in Tanzania or that kind of thing. I think that you know what you said, Kristen, about his network. I mean, really, according to the analysis that I've heard, is that actually in, in the family he's not the strongest one. That there are stronger members of the family who control more companies, and you know, who who actually you're pushing him to do X, Y, and Z, and so the the um, the immunity for him, uh, you know, probably is is a lot less relevant. I think that actually the more relevant um, part of this is the disincentive. I don't think that nearly the amount of um, disincentives in terms of like whether his companies would be allowed to continue to operate, whether they would be on sanctions list, whether they um, would, be a, would, would, would be able to open bank accounts uh, globally, whether people would trade with them, etc. I think that that is actually, um, it, it, we just scratched the surface on some of those pressures um, in the last couple of years, but you know, not nearly enough pressure to actually change that, that equation. I think that if, if there were some very serious disincentives, um, uh, at least from the international side, that, that, that we could see um, uh, perhaps him being interested in some of those <laughs> incentives. Um, but I don't think we saw any real interest. I think there's some, there were actually some real options on the table for him quietly through, um, through some uh, African um, uh, diplomacy and so forth, but uh, no, no interest in taking them. Thank you. Professor Desolais. Uh, I just think, um, well, it's country by country, like JT was saying. But in the case of Kabila, I mean, nobody got more time to negotiate his own exit. <laughs> and we still fail at it. I mean, the guy stayed two years <laughs> over time. Yeah. And yeah. the problem is, the longer he waited, the more crimes were committed. Mm. Yeah? We had mass graves appear. We've, so it was like he was continuing, he had the rope and he continued turning <laughs> the noose himself. Um, this is not an unresolvable. I mean, we have people like Jerry Rawlings. We have other people who step down, but they step down on their terms. Mm -hmm. uh, they face similar situation. They step down. So I think this is part of a little bit of the challenge with Kabila, uh, because a, his supporters think his situation is so unique, and he has come to believe that, and people outside also have come to believe that, when in fact his situation is not unique. Mm. Um, his situation became more and more like Babo in Cote d'Ivoire. Because the longer you wait, the less you have room to negotiate and then event catch with you, catch up with you. And I think in the Kabila case, that's the situation. So if the people had not taken to the streets, Kabila would still be there. He was not thinking about any exit. Mm. In fact, we saw that he tried to force somebody on the people. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if any of that stuff would have worked. Uh, in that sense, I think I'm more closer to what Sasha is saying. Mm -hmm. What are the levers that we can use to push this guy? Because he was just not coming to the table. In fact, he still not want to come to the table. Right, right. <laughs> he wants to stick around and be in the, in the parliament. So somewhere, I don't know if he himself or people around him think they can play, uh, uh, play out everybody else. So outrun everybody, outplay everyone. But everybody can see him coming. And I think he doesn't realize that. So Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we have time for one or two more questions and a final lightning round, and then we'll wrap up and then... Uh, again, thank you and wish you well for the weekend. But start here with the front row. And is there anybody else also who has a final question? Okay, so we'll have these two, and then we'll come back, starting with JT, working down to finish up. Steve Landing, Manchester Trade. Uh, those who know me know I'm a trade guy. I also work for she, I also work for Cici Kedi campaign. But I hate to tell you, compared to how much money Mr. Kutumbi had, Mr. Kutumbi has spent on the election, we spend very little. I'm very surprised about the one-sided nature of this whole discussion. Because there were arguments on the other side, and I haven't heard one of them, and so on. The fact of the matter is that 66% of the, the time they had the decision in Geneva that ended up choosing as the candidate, Mr. Fayula, the fact of the matter is that there was an overwhelming majority in favor of Felix, and we put Felix and Victor Camiri together, you had 66% disappeared. The fact during the election, uh, at least for, for somebody who did not seem to do, did very poorly at the polls, he certainly were able to draw the large crowds. And his crowds were more, even larger than Martin Fayula's crowds and so on. Yet at the end of the day, there's an announcement made, not that Fayula got X, not that uh, Shadari got X amount of votes, but that Felix got only 4% more than that. That's ridiculous. He has the biggest party. He has the, all the support. He had 77%, at, 66% at the beginning of the vote. What is Kutumbi doing with all his money? How is it being spent? How did the NYU poll that first came out and identified 
and identify Felix and Victor with 66% of the vote. How did that suddenly change? And the guy, had to, but I think he had 7% at the beginning. I don't want to misquote me, but it was 14. How did he go all the way up to 50%? My real objection is that no one is really doing an analysis. So starting from the basis that one electoral alleged leak resulted in all kinds of projections and what the result was going to be. And nobody talks about Mr. Kutumbi's own interest. And the worst thing of the whole discussion, in my view, is that in the United States, we had two, we had three interesting elections. In my youth, Mr. Kennedy certainly stole the election from Mr. Nixon because of what happened in Chicago with the father and the bootleg. Well, why don't we, I no, trust, trust me, I, I, let me make so my point quickly. No, trust me, please trust me. I'll make my point in one second. your case. No, just trust me. <laughs> yeah, people, interesting question. Excuse me, people have made the point that, that Mr. Fiuli has a right to object to the election. Mr. Nixon, horrible guy, he said, I'll accept the election. When Mr. Gore lost, he said, I'll accept the election. People are talking about two terms being great. Thank God we didn't elect Weldon Wilkie Wild as president. And then who's happier to have Mr. Trump than the person they beat? The point I want to make here is very simple. And that is that you're all bringing to yourself your prejudice. You've decided that somehow Mr. Fayuli won the election and you do not look, you do not give a balanced approach. Thank you. This gentleman here, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, thank you. My name is JT Stanley. Thank you guys for your work. Um, it was brought up multiple ways in which we could go ahead and improve Congo, like sanction regimes, such as your colleague John Prendergast has talked about the UN, uh, things like the Security Force Assistance Brigade. But it seems that the issue isn't so much having the right tools, but the will to use them. I mean, for instance, we've used Green Braves to go ahead and pursue the LRA with Ugandans in the past. And like the Security Force uh, Assistance Brigade is essentially a knockoff of Green Braves. Like we've used these sanction regimes before on like North Korea. The issue is there's not the political will in the U.S. to go ahead and actually execute or in their national community, not so much a lack of the tools. So my question is, especially for the like for us in the audience here is, how do we go ahead and incentivize our own government to actually go ahead and use the tools that you guys have gone ahead and talked about? Thank you. Thank you. So JT, you want to start? We'll just have a final answer and or concluding comment, one or two minutes per person, please. Um, I don't support Felix Chesichetti. I don't support Martin Fayulu. I don't support Kabila. Um, we looked at the electoral process. I work in 17 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. I have a unique job in Washington, D.C. I can look at 17 countries at once and see uh, how these different processes play out. This was not a credible process. It wasn't a credible process, and I can talk to you afterwards about the multiple violations to the constitutional articles. I can talk to you about the electoral law. I can talk to you the way in which the process was conducted. All right? What we're dealing with here is a problem that will not just have an effect on the Congolese people, but will have a reverberating trend throughout the continent. Right? If you can steal an election and manipulate an election in such a way, and I'm not saying Chisiketti stole the election. I'm saying that the election process was not credible. The will of the Congolese people, who stood on line for hours, by the way, and the electronic voting machines didn't work, so then like, by 3 o'clock they didn't vote yet, and then a bunch of them had to leave. The problem is that these people did not have the ability to express their will. You also have 1.25 million people who still have not voted for president who would have, if you looked at the demographics and you looked at the numbers, would have probably gone for Fayulu. And then if you look at the margin of victory, right, 600 and some thousand, that, that really calls into question. If these people had voted, what would have happened? So there's a lot of questions here. And questions should be talked about, questions that I think help the Congolese people to figure out how to make elections better in the future. And that's what my interest is here not to promote one candidate or another. Great, thanks. Ndamba. Yeah, I think the, the point that Mr. Landy raises are valid, but I think the challenge, this is the part, uh, on our panel I talked about a division, that this thing has become a divisive experience, mm. is because Felix Chisekedi supporters assume that everybody who questioned the process is questioning everything about Felix, mm -hmm. but it's not about Felix. That's not the point. The point is about the process, and the process was not good. And I think UDPS also added more to the suspicion. In the same, talking about the U.S. in the same way the Trump administration, the Trump people were talking about Russia and Russia and Russia. And Russia has not gone away because that was part of the pronouncement. Russia find email, Russia do this. The same way happened with the Chisekedi crowd. They start talking about negotiation with Kabila. Why people are waiting for the, the... And they said, we are very confident that we will win. 
Well, what gives you the confidence that you will win when the issue in one level, on one level was my crowd is bigger, my fufu is bigger, all that stuff? That's fine. Stop. But eventually, for that crowd. we will find it in the numbers and the transparency. So once Senko and the leak from Seni start coming out, as an analyst, for instance, I'll be curious to see UDPS numbers. UDPS has not produced their numbers. I don't know what they're doing with them. Uh, I would like to see Seni's number. UDPS should insist that Seni put its number out. Station level. We might not believe in the numbers, but we'll have them mm -hmm. to start doing comparison. So I think in that sense, there's some element there. I don't think this is actually on the social media, it's crazy. Because when people ask basic questions, UDPS people just attack everybody, assuming that somehow, no, everybody's Congolese. People want the country to move forward. People want to, the next president to succeed. Not to fail, but we're not going just to accept it as an analyst speaking for myself to accept this because he said he said there was too many things that were not right. His pronouncement himself, um, Sasha was just talking this cozy up to causing up to Kabila, saying he's our strategic partner. Since when? You know, it's, it's those kind of issues that create these clouds around him. Uh, his president now, he can now insist on Senate to release those numbers. He's not doing that. And I think that's a problem. Uh, people want to believe there was some credibility to it. But nobody has that in this case, not in his side. And I think this is, since you are in touch with him, this is something that needs to be handed to them. It's like, we're going to work with what we have. If, uh, as an analyst, that's what we do. We work with what we have. We don't think about what you guys discuss in the back door or whatever. No, it doesn't work that way. We can only analyze what we have. So whether it comes across as bias or not, that is, I can see that. We all have biases, either because of what we do or whatever. But it also behooves them to push the SENI and themselves to publish their numbers so we can compare. Sasha. Um, like JT highlighted, uh, we also don't support any particular candidate or party. Um, we, uh, but we, we did see the... Um, analysis published by um, uh, from the leaked data from the Senco. Um, also, there was a great analysis by Pierre Engelbert in African Arguments. If you haven't read that, who said that there was a z based on the data that was released um, or leaked, uh, it was a 0.0 percent chance that Mr. Chisiketi, Mr. Chisiketi um, was actually elected by the Congolese people. Um, and of course, the Financial Times article, which said that there was huge f electoral fraud that took place. So I think that you know um, uh, my point is that. Um, th there needs to be some accountability for that, and particularly the United States that you know has this issue of um, undermining democratic institutions and have made a number of threats along those lines to hold people accountable. This is this is the time to do so now, even though um, there is a, there is a new president and and we are um, going forward to work with them. Um, JT, thank you for highlighting your point. Yes, indeed. We do have these tools, and the United States does use them on Russia, North Korea, on, on countering terrorism, on, on stopping drug trafficking, etc. Look, look at what we're doing on Venezuela right now, for example. Um, and so, um, but there, there is a major, there are a couple major gaps here. I think one is um, uh, actual capacity to, uh, to gather the information, let's face it. The, all the United States and Intel assets are not being um, funneled towards Congo. Um, that uh, you know, we, we are putting them towards countering you know ISIS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, uh, Iran, uh, uh, you name it. And so um, uh, that's why we set up the Century as an investigative initiative to say, okay, look, we're actually going to have a team of investigators and whistleblowers go around and, and gather the actual um, granular data on how the corruption is happening and how this is this violates various statutes. And so therefore, here. Treasury Department, here's what you can do with that. And, and, um, uh, but, but the Treasury Department needs to um, do more of that in Congress, um, is, is the flip side of that, needs to help resource them to say, actually, we really care about um, these issues. We're not just going to, we, we, of course, um, we're not going to ignore our national security priorities, but let's put a little bit more money on Africa so that we can investigate those things and do some of the things that you highlighted. Um, I think the, the idea of um, some sort of a security assistance program that would, you know, help um, effectively counter groups like the FDLR is a great one. And, and this may be a, a good time. I would wait a couple of months to see sort of where um, President Chisiketi is going to shake up the military so that it's not the same corrupt uh, military actors. The last one, by the way, was 
found um, distributing uh, arms and ammunition to the rebel groups. So we don't want people like that um, uh, to work on it, but to to uh, to do that and, and and then you know to build the political will. This is where Congress comes in. There was a great bill last year that many of us um, uh, helped work on as well, um, Congo called the Congo Democracy and Accountability Act, and um, and and that should be reintroduced um, and and would help empower um, the administration. Thanks. Excellent. And Kristen for the last word. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think the hard part in Congo right now is we don't know the real results. We have competing results. Probably both of them are not, you know, fully, uh, fully, fully correct. Um, and, the, and the problem is that you know the, the process that was laid out for how to count the results, make them public. You know, those there was no transparency. We, the rules were not necessarily followed, um, and that's the problem. That's I think what the court was asked to do to say process was not followed. We need to uh, step back. You know, do a recount. Um, but we're not given the chance to do that. And I, uh, I, you know, I think in, in Kenya that was what, what happened, right? That the rules were not following the election. The court stepped in and said we need to uh, look at this more, more, more closely. And so you know, I, I think going forward that's where we need to focus, right? Having processes followed, having clear, uh, clear rules, and then having uh, accountability when the rules are, are, not, are not followed so, so that we can know the true results. Because pre-election polling, as we all found out in 2016 in the U.S., you know, it's not, not worth, <laughs> worth uh, the paper it's written on. Um, and so, right, we need the, the true results, and we don't have them yet. I'll also just finish with one additional final note, which is I don't think I heard anyone on either panel suggest that we should not try to work with President Xi Shikedi, and that he doesn't, I don't think I heard anyone suggest that he doesn't have the potential to be an important leader in DRC. So I will finish with those two important points. I think I want to thank Mulala and Laura as well as this panel and Tom and all of you for being here. Please join me in the applause. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.